We're looking at the book of Joel, the book of Joel, prophetic book of Joel, Yoel Hanavi in Hebrew. There are approximately a dozen people named Joel in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. We don't know if any of them are the Joel who authored this book. In fact, the only thing we know about this Joel, distinguishing him from the others, is his father's name, Petuel, Petuel. Joel simply means Yahweh is God. And whenever you see an affirmation of Yahweh as God, it usually denotes that there's a problem with idolatry, of people forgetting that Yahweh is the one true God. It usually has that kind of connotation. Now, when people needed to be reminded of that, it wasn't that they just automatically began worshiping other gods. They began by confusing Yahweh with other gods. Uh, again, a phenomenon we've pointed out many times. Uh, you see this both theologically and Christologically. For instance, there are those who are teaching the error that Yahweh, Yahweh, is Allah of Islam, the Nabataean moon god. They're convoluting the two gods, yet they claim to be believers, born-again believers, evangelicals, but they're teaching this thing. They're mixing the identity of the true God with a false one. Or you have it done with Christ, the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Eucharistic Christ of Rome. They mix the true one with the false one. But it affirms Yahweh is God. This is a problem we see today with those who are trying to make Islam compatible with Christianity. No, no. You have a linguistic problem in the Arabic with, with El and Allah that's complicated. Uh, not too complicated, but it's easy to cause confusion. But there is nothing in Arabic that would indicate Yahweh. Yahweh is purely from the Hebrew scriptures. It's a uh, the generic term for God, El, El, Allah, Elohim, that's where the problem happens because Arabic and Hebrew are both, and Aramaic are all Semitic languages, essentially. That is the source of the problem. But there is nothing in the Quran or the Hadith or any of these other things that would identify Allah with Yahweh. Hence, you see, Yoel, Yahweh is God, okay? Or Elijah. Eliyahu, my God is Yahweh. This affirmation or attestation as to the personal name of God as opposed to the generic term for God or even a uh, uh, generic, uh, certainly a generic term for God or even a proper name for God in certain languages. But Yahweh is exclusive to the Hebrew scriptures. Now, the Hebrew scriptures say Yahweh very often, but it's usually translated into English as Lord, the Lord. But when you read the original Hebrew, it doesn't say the Lord. It says Yahweh. In Psalm 23, it doesn't, does not say the Lord is my shepherd. It does not say that in Psalm 23. There's no such thing. It says Yahweh is my shepherd. Hence the affirmation of Yahweh by his personal name. So there's no convolution of God as a generic title where other gods become mixed with him. This, of course, would suggest this was an issue in his day, much the same as it's become an issue in our day, and it has been an issue at other times in the history of both Israel and the church. Nonetheless, that's purely by way of preface and introduction. So we move on. The Disagreement in academic opinion among scholars is, is primarily concerned not with the authorship, but with the time, the time it was written. Because the enemies of Judah are listed as being Egyptians and Philistines and such people, as opposed to the Babylonians or the Assyrians, that supports the idea in the thinking of some scholars, that it was pre-Babylonian captivity. The other consideration is that, on the converse side, that the national leadership of Judah was seen, seemed to be more emphatically the clergy as opposed to the royalty. This would suggest a post-captivity uh, date for the book. 
Uh, also, because of, of certain technical linguistic reasons, they are, remain very divided, very divided. Is it written before or is it written after the Babylonian captivity? What is agreed, the consensus is that it was written to Judah, not Israel. And the fact that Judah, the 10 northern kingdoms, are not mentioned, well, that is something that could be seen as supporting a post-captivity view of the time. Now, why do I make such an issue out of this? Well, essentially, in order to correctly determine what it means for our time, it is always, always necessary to determine what it meant for the time it was written. The majority of conservative so-called evangelical scholars, and I use the term evangelical sparingly these days, the consensus is it was pre-captivity written sometime around the reign of King Joash. I agree with that position. I agree with that position. That is not to say I'm absolutely dogmatic about it, and it's not to say that those who take a contrary view don't have a case to be made. I'm simply saying I believe the weight of evidence supports it to be a pre-captivity book, pre-captivity writing by the prophet Joel, Yoel Hanavi. Like all of Israel's prophets, Joel prophesies, of course, for three time periods, as we always point out. He's prophesying something about his own time, whenever that may be, He's prophesying something for the first coming of Christ, and he's prophesying for the close of the age and the return of Christ. He's prophesying for three different time frames. And although he is prophesying primarily for Judah and the Jews, there are ramifications and implications of his prophecies that also apply to the church. More about that aspect next week. But right now, let's look at Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. Read it along with me, please. I'm reading from the New American Standard this evening. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Petuel. Remember, false prophets will give you a word. True prophets will point you to the word. And Jesus is the word who became flesh. The scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture incarnate. There is an encounter with Christ as the Logos, who was eternal. Before he was born, he existed in eternity, and he's the eternal word of God incarnate. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Petuel. And he appeals to the leadership in terms of the religious eldership, essentially. Now, the reason it could be pre-captivity is, under Zedekiah, the royal leadership had become so corrupt and godless, there was no point talking to them. We see this, for instance, in the book of, of Jeremiah. Some of these kings, like, like Manasseh, even as early as the time of Isaiah, but certainly later with Zedekiah, they became so evil, so godless, so detached from the realities of the word of God and out of communication with, with, with God in any sense. There was no point talking to them, no point talking to them. He makes a desperate appeal to the clergy who exist to maintain the temple worship. They're ritually maintaining the temple worship. Just think of a country where the religion is part of the culture. People will go to church for cultural reasons. They don't really have a personal faith. They just attend church. You see this in some Protestant countries. You see it in certainly some Catholic countries. People will just attend church for cultural reason because it's part of their national cultural identity. But in terms of personal faith, you're really, really stretching the point. Let's look. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and 
let your sons tell their sons and their sons to the next generation. Notice he is speaking of something prophetically, something prophetically that will have implications and possibly fulfillment for future generations. Now look at the question that he asks. Has anything like this happened? Has anything like this happened? Turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel, the Hebrew prophet Daniel, chapter 12. Verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation. You see in Daniel, speaking of the close of the age, nothing like this has happened before. Joel, of course, speaks of the day of the Lord. Nothing like this has happened before. Look with me, please, to the Olivet Discourse. Matthew chapter 24. What does Jesus say? Jesus makes it very clear that nothing like this will have happened before. Nothing on this scale will have ever taken place. Things foreshadowing it will have taken place, but nothing like the tumultuous events predicted in the Olivet Discourse will have happened before, nor ever happen again. If the Lord did not intervene, nobody would even survive it in verse 22. It's something that is historically unique. Nothing like it ever happens before. Nothing like it ever happens again. This, of course, throws out the bogus teaching that it was all fulfilled in 70 AD, which is held by radical preterists. And they say that the book of Revelation and Matthew 24 and so forth, the Olivet Discourse all happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Well, the fact of the matter is, Far worse things than 70 AD have happened both to the Jews and to the Christian church as seriously catastrophic as those events of 70 AD were. Hence, the Lord Jesus makes it clear that nothing like this has happened before. There will be a great tribulation, verse 21, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Daniel, Jesus, and Joel all make the same point. This puts Joel's predictions into a perspective that it has a future meaning. Also, testifying it to your sons and to the next generation. Now we get to verse 4. What is it? What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Okay. So you have the gnawing locust, the swarming locust, and then you have the creeping locust, and then the stripping locust. Four waves of plague of locusts. Four. Okay. We'll return to that in just a moment. But let's look at verse 5. Awake, drunkards, and weep. Wail all you wine drinkers on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. Notice that Joel opens, he opens with a, an appeal, a desperate, very serious appeal for sobriety, for sobriety. This idea of sobriety, again, is echoed by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Jesus echoes this same idea and it's found various other places throughout both Testaments as well. This urgent need to maintain 
sobriety. For instance, Jesus speaks of the good and faithful servant. And he says in verse 49, uh, if that evil servant uh, says his master is not coming for a long time and shall begin to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. Um, inebriation. Remember, wine, alcohol, is spirits. It's the same word, isn't it? Spirits. You drink spirits, drink wine. The same, same thing. Uh, there's the new wine, the Holy Spirit, but there are other spirits. People become intoxicated by wrong spirits. We've said this so many times, I don't even want to say it again, but the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, ikrete. New Testament says that. Okay. If you drink the new wine, you're not going to be out of control. If you drink another wine, you'll be drunk, as happened in the counterfeit revivals of Pensacola and Toronto that were promoted by the Elam movement and people of this nature. Okay. But sobriety... I'm not joking. The South African money preacher, Rodney Howard Brown, who was a proponent of this kind of uh, levity and hysterics and inebriated behavior in church, saying it was the Holy Spirit. His theme song of his ministry was called Drinking at Joel's Place. Drinking at Joel's Place. As if Joel's Place was the name of a bar or a pub or a cocktail lounge or something like that, and it's where Christians went to get drunk. And he called it drinking at Joel's place. Well, that was Rodney Howard Brown. Joel, however, opens his book by saying, sober up, don't be drunk. Satan wants Christians inebriated. He wants them spiritually deluded. He wants them consumed by other spirits. When somebody has been drinking alcohol, their behavior becomes incoherent, their judgment becomes uh, impaired. They can be a danger to themselves and others if they attempt to operate a, a vehicle or anything of this nature. They may say things that are inappropriate that they wouldn't have said had they not been inebriated, all kinds of things. Some people, there's a predisposition to violent behavior and things of this nature, and argumentation, argumentative, and even violent behavior. It causes all kinds of problems. Well, the same as organic inebriation does that, spiritual inebriation does that. When you see people inebriated by wrong spirits, you're going to find all of this anger, you're going to find people making crazy judgments teaching and believing crazy things, and so forth. Sober up. Sober up. At a time we need to be sober, Satan wants Christians intoxicated, drunk. Okay. Then it continues. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. Notice these are not ordinary locusts. It has made my vine a waste. Well, locusts do that. And my fig tree splinters. It does that. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Notice the final wave of locusts in the plague were the stripping ones. Their branches have become white. Then he says, Wear like a virgin, girded with sackcloth, for the bridegroom of her youth. Wail, a weeping bride. Cry for the bridegroom. The grain offering and the libation are cut off, alluding to temple sacrificial rituals in the Levitical priesthood. It's cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The field is ruined, the land mourns, the grain is ruined, the new wine dries up. Notice new wine dries up. 
the real moving of the Holy Spirit is not there. Fresh oil fails. The shemen, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't work. Okay. Be ashamed, O farmers. Wear, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed, there is no food. The vine dries up, the fig tree fails, the pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. Now notice the references to this kind of fruit and fauna, and pomegranates and all these things and apples is what you see in the Song of Solomon when the bride is celebrating the coming of the bridegroom and they're getting ready to celebrate their wedding. Here, that's all of these things, these fruits and, and, and the celebratory atmosphere of the new wine and the, the pomegranates and the apples it's gone. The bride is, or the virgin is told to weep. Weep for the bridegroom, not celebrate as in the Song of Solomon. There is an opposite description of what you see with the coming of the bridegroom and the Song of Solomon in this text. It then continues. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Well, O ministers of the altar, come spend the night in sackcloth. A, a reiterated series of appeals for repentance. O ministers of my God, for the grain offering and the libation are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land, to the house of the Lord your God and cry out. Now look at this. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Has not food been cut off from before our eyes? Gladness and joy from the house of our God. The seed shrivel under the clods the storehouses are desolate. The barns are torn down. The grain is dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle wander aimlessly because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To thee, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. In other words, the trees of the field are not clapping their hands. Even the beasts of the field pant for thee, for the water brooks are dried up and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. This continues through verse 17 of chapter 2. At verse 17 of chapter 2, the focus and theme flips, flips. But it continues this way, almost lethargically, about this impending series of calamities that are coming involving drought and plague of locusts. He talks about the day of the Lord. Turn with me very briefly, please, to understand these themes back to, to the, to the I'm sorry, next the next book in the English canon, he was a little bit different. Uh, Joel is one of the 12 minor prophets, and they're called the Shtimus today in Hebrew. But another one is Amos. Look at the book of Amos, please. Chapter 4, verse 7. I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months to harvest. Now, we know what that means. God would withhold rain because rain was seen as a blessing of his provision. But when the rain was withheld, it was a mark of the people's sin. It was a judgment to bring them to repent. As most of you know, in Isaiah chapter 43, we read, uh, 
that, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, we read that the water that's poured out is the Holy Spirit. The water that's poured out is the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 44, 3. When God is angry because of unrepentant sin, the Holy Spirit is not poured out. There is spiritual drought, and then the next thing that happens as a result of the drought, Amos tells us, is the food is destroyed. There is a famine. Amos concludes by saying, a time is going to come when there will be a famine, a famine for the hearing of the word of God, a famine for the hearing of the word of God. It's what's going to happen. Uh, now, Amos goes very much in hand in the Old Testament with Joel. Look at Amos, please, chapter 8. It'll come about in that day, I'll make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark and broad daylight. This, of course, has prophetic meaning for the first coming of Christ. We read in Luke, we have a teaching on Amos explaining that, but I only mention that in passing. It's not our purpose now. Secondly, he goes on and he talks about sackcloth in verse 10. And in verse 11, the days are coming when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God. In other words, the drought and the famine are figures of things spiritual. This is not to say that Joel for his own day was not speaking of natural meteorological disasters and pestilences or plagues. It's not to say there wasn't the literal in the time of Joel, but it is to say that Amos tells us there's a deeper spiritual meaning to it. You just look now. We live in a time, and we have for the last 25 years nearly, where there's been a famine for the hearing of the word of God. There's been a famine for the hearing of the word of God. And the Holy Spirit has not been outpoured. Uh, we've had counterfeit revivals and people trying to make believe it was raining, but th there hasn't been any revival. It just hasn't happened. Well, Amos is in this sense, the Old Testament partner thematically of Joel. But Joel tells us it's going to get dark. The sun and moon will not give their light. Amos says the same thing. A darkness is going to come. What does Jesus say in Matthew 24? A darkness. You see it in Amos. You see it in Matthew. You see it in Joel. When you see that pattern, you know that all three texts are speaking of the same thing from different aspects, prophetically. Going back to Joel now. Let us begin with these locusts, with these locusts. There are those who have asserted that these four swarms of locusts correspond to the four world empires in Daniel. That is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. There are those who have said that, and I understand why people would say that. But I'm convinced it cannot be right for the following reason. These locusts were all destructive. All four swarms of locusts, all four plagues, were destructive. When we look at the four kingdoms in Daniel, the Persians and the Medes, the Media Persians, they were not destructive towards the Jews. They were benevolent towards the Jews and played a role in the restoration after the captivity. So the Persians initially were not locusts. They were not a threat to Israel. 
Later on, the Persians became a potential threat because of the geopolitics with Rome. At that time, they were called Parthians. And we know from Daniel, in the last days, the Persians, that is Iran, will become the premier threat to Israel. We know that. But in the Old Testament times that being prophesied here, Persia was not a threat. Under Cyrus the Great, under Darius the Mede, there was a benevolent policy towards Israel, towards Judah, towards the Jews. So you cannot say that the Persians at that time were locusts who destroyed. They weren't. The Babylonians, you can say that. You can say that certainly about the Assyrians earlier for the 10 northern kingdoms. You can say it about the Seleucid Greeks. You can say it about Rome, but you cannot say it about the Persians. It just does not fit historically. It just doesn't fit the historical record found in the scriptures or in secular history for that matter. It just doesn't fit, okay, or, or in Jewish history. It just doesn't fit. So who are these four swarms? Taking the view that it is a pre-Babylonian captivity prophecy, I'm rather convinced that these four swarms of locusts have two meanings. One, they are the four invasions by Nebuchadnezzar, by the Babylonians before the captivity. They represent the four invasions. These invasions were progressive. The first time they came in, in the first invasion, when the Babylonians first arrived, they swarmed in, okay, and they gnawed, they pilfered, they looted. Okay. Then there was the creeping locust. They kept coming back for more. Okay. There was the creeping locust. There was the gnawing locust, then the swarming locust, then the creeping locust. The swarming ones were the actual invasion. Okay. The Babylonians attacked peripherally initially, gnawing, but then the swarm. Then comes the creeping locusts. They went into everything. They got into everything. If there's an infestation of something, like right now, there's a terrible infestation of mice in uh, southern Queensland, even northern Victoria, and in uh, New South Wales, in uh, Australia. Well, they're not just out in the barn <laughs> or out on the grain field. They're getting into houses. They're, they... What makes it, they're creeping into people's beds and into people's uh, wardrobes and into children's cots and cribs. They creep. The swarms are bad enough, but when they creep in to your house, it, it's revolting, isn't it? And it's happening now in Australia. Pray for Australia. I don't know which is worse, the mice in, in, in New South Wales or the state government in Victoria. But let's look. Four swarms. Then came the stripping locusts. They took what was left away. The temple artifacts, the objects of worship, were taken to Babylon. All of the nobility and the skilled labor as it were, the professional class were taken away to Babylon. The educated people were deported. Only a few, a small number of poor and largely uneducated people were left in the land. Anything that was left was stripped away. Okay. And they came like locusts. Now, these locusts are violent and dangerous. They are described as having characteristics of devouring beasts, of devouring beasts. Now, I read this in Hebrew today. I read some, some of the book of Joel in Hebrew today. But I also was reading about locust plagues. And uh, locust plagues are interesting. They are triggered by droughts. 
They are triggered by droughts. Swarms, plagues of locusts, like we have in East Africa today, follow seasons of drought. Locusts devour everything green. They build up and build up and build up during a drought. As soon as the drought begins to end, and people think that they're going to have water for the cattle and things like this, and you see this very much in East Africa. As soon as people think it's going to improve, thank heavens, the drought is over. That is when the locusts come in and destroy everything. There'll be no grass for the cows to eat. The locusts are biding their time. There is a drought for the hearing of the word of God, but then there is a famine for the word of God itself. There is a drought for the spirit of God, rather, or better put, a drought for the spirit of God, but no rain, no grain, no rain, no grain. Following the drought for the spirit comes an absence of food. And this is demonic in origin. It's demonic in origin. When you see false teachers undermining biblical doctrine, this is demonic in origin. They're devouring <laughs> things. There's no food. It, 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 what's there is just inedible junk. What's left is inedible junk after this kind of a demonic attack. Now, what am I saying here? I don't know if we'll get into chapter 2 today, but let's understand the locusts. Something we will talk about next week. These locusts are called the great army of God's judgment. The great army of God's judgment. And as we will see next week, the foolishness and ignorance of people who are seduced by dominion theology and kingdom now theology and triumphalism, all this kind of nonsense and reconstructionism. The people who believe this kingdom now over-realized eschatology. They have a chorus they sing from Joel. They say, we run on the cities, they run on the wall. Great is the army who carries his word. They think they're singing about themselves. They're singing about these locusts in the context of Joel. And some of the hatchet jobs I've seen even by so-called evangelical theologians do on the book of Joel is unbelievable. There was Jack Deere, formerly, I think, of Dallas Seminary, trying to justify the false teachings and false prophecies of the Kansas City false prophets. Uh, and he said, well, Joel is difficult to interpret, but he got into this whole thing of, of, of its the latter day reign, the manifest sons of God, the conquering victorious church. It doesn't talk about a latter day reign yet. It talks about a drought. Yes, it's God's army, his army of judgment. Correction. I've been warning for years that Islam is God's instrument of judgment on the backslidden Judeo-Christian world. It's God's judgment on Israel, and it's God's judgment on Christianized nations. It's evil, but it's God's judgment. Islam is God's judgment. Now, we know after these evil armies fulfilled the purposes of God, he destroys them. And we know God's going to destroy Islam and, and these nations that believe it. These things are prophesied in Isaiah and so forth. We know that that's coming. But in the meantime, he's using it. Now, let's look at these locusts once again. I point you to the fact that in verse 15, of chapter 1, Joel talks about the day of the Lord coming as destruction from the Almighty. 
Where is this? I don't know why more. I don't know. I don't really read a lot of commentaries uh, much. Sometimes I may check something in a commentary after I go to the Lord about it or if I'm interested in something technical, but I generally don't rely on commentaries. I rely on the Holy Spirit and on interpreting Scripture in light of Scripture. That is not to say that there are not commentators who God has not used. It's just to say the first commentary on Scripture is other Scripture. And we get our, uh, our guide is not commentators, it's the Holy Spirit. He may use these other things, but they're always a secondary resource or even a tertiary resource, okay? A secondary or tertiary resource. Personally, if I use some extra biblical resource, it's generally for linguistic reasons. But let's look now, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Chapter 9. This is after the rapture. The day of the Lord takes place after the rapture. The rapture and resurrection of the church inaugurates the day of the Lord, the day of his wrath. And during that period, as we've said many times, God begins to turn his prophetic purposes back to dealing with Israel and the Jews, howbeit in the darkest hour of their history. Chapter 9, verse 1. Remember, the faithful church is gone by this time. The trumpets come out of the seventh seal, therefore they must be sequential, they cannot be concurrent. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen to earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Notice the darkening of the cosmos. Olivet Discourse, Joel, the book of Revelation. Remember when Jesus said, now Satan is cast down. Satan counterfeits Jesus in the person of Antichrist. I won't go into the Hebrew now, but Jesus is the bright and morning star. Satan is called the star of the morning. It's almost the same thing. He tries to counterfeit, to approximate. Now I saw Satan cast down. When Satan was cast down, he entered Judas. The next time Satan is cast down, he will, of course, have entered the Antichrist completely. This is not to say that the Antichrist will not already be active and demon-possessed. He will. But when this happens, at some point, some think that when he's assassinated and mimics the resurrection, or at this point, whenever it happens, you will be looking at a de facto incarnation of Satan. Okay? A de facto incarnation of Satan. The Antichrist will be a man before that. He'll be a man before that. But once this happens, it goes beyond that. Now, this is a very deep subject, obviously, and we talk about it in our book, Shadows of the Beast. I'm only dealing with it now insofar as it relates to our study in Joel. A star is cast from heaven. Okay. He opens the bottomless pit. Okay. Like the smoke of the great furnace, and the sun and air were darkened by the smoke of the pit, and out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth. There they are. Power was given them as the 
scorpions of the earth have power. Now, Jesus spoke of scorpions as figures of the demonic, didn't he? You will tread on scorpions, things like this. The power of the demonic. Okay. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, locusts go after green things. Once Satan is fully unleashed, they're not interested in green things. They're interested in humans. There's already a famine before this. They were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree. That is contrary to the nature of locusts. Now remember something. Locusts, although an insect, were kosher. They were edible. John the Baptist ate them. He survived on them. Okay. The locusts will devour wicked men. Godly men will devour the locusts. Remember, John the Baptist has to do with the spirit of Elijah. You know where I'm going, but not tonight. Let's look. Only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. In other words, the 144,000 are protected. And they were not permitted to kill anyone. Locusts are not lethal to people. They destroy the food supply. But to torment for five months, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. They will torment for a five-month period. I do not understand the significance of the five-month period. There is a significance, but at the present time, I'm not sure what it is. I can only speculate. But there is some kind of a meaning why it is five months. Okay. That obviously relates to the general's timing of the other trumpets. Now, those days... Men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. The day of the Lord is going to become so terrible that people will want to die. God will make them live in a hell on earth. What's really odd is we are told that they still did not depart of their wicked deeds, but let's look. The appearance of the locusts, it's still talking about locusts, was like the horses prepared for battle. And on their heads, as it were, crowns like old. Their faces were like the faces of men. These are humanoid creatures. They had hair like the hair of women, meaning long, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. And they have tails like scorpions, there's the scorpions again, and stings. And in their tail is their power to hurt men for five months. There's the five months again. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, obviously. 
an apparition of Satan on earth. He comes in a tangible form. And in Greek, Apollyon, destroyer, of course. On the word for the weekend, we discussed this a few weeks ago. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. In the book of Revelation, we have famously the three woes. The three woes. The three woes, woes are released or dispatched, dispatched with the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets. The fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are when they are dispatched. Okay. Very interesting situation. Now, with the seventh trumpet, in between the sixth and seventh trumpet, we see an interlude. The same as you have an interlude in between the sixth and seventh seal in chapter seven, when the rapture and resurrection take place. There's an interlude between the sixth and seventh seal. We deal with this in our book, Hard Pezzo. When the rapture takes place, so too there is an interlude in between the sixth and seventh trumpet. During that period of woes, the two witnesses will be in direct confrontation with Antichrist. So we have the three woes. The first woe, the second woe, and then with the third woe, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Then the book of Revelation reverts and retells the same story from a different perspective, resuming with the six bowls of wrath in chapter 16. The six, the, 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 I'm sorry, the bowls of wrath um, in chapter 16 happen, it seems, very quickly, very, very quickly in a short time space. But that's not our subject now. So the book of Joel, chapter 1, with the locusts, Okay. has its prophetic fulfillment at the close of the age with the first woe. The first woe is the locusts. It is prefigured by what happened with the Babylonian captivity. Only, of course, in Revelation, it'll be Babylon the Great, but it's the same pattern. As always, we look at what did happen to understand what's going to happen. We don't understand the history. We will not understand the prophecy. You had the locusts, the four invasions by the Babylonians and the devastation that they bought. This resulted in a destruction and desecration of the temple and so forth and the captivity into Babylon. Four swarms of locusts. The starvation, the siege, the starvation, the genocidal conditions that Judah went through at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's fourth invasion. Uh, that is a picture of what is going to happen at, in the book of Revelation. Now, I'm trying to work it out. That that fourth invasion, when things were really terrible, by Nebuchadnezzar, the fourth invasion where things became insurmountable 
and excruciating to the point of being humanly unbearable virtually. Those conditions span the period of five months. <laughs> that would explain the five months in Revelation. It would explain it. The fourth invasion took place over a period of about five months, but I'm not 100% sure yet. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said it, but <clears throat> I did say it. That would, in large part, explain it. His invasions always took place over a period of some months. And the fourth one took place over a period of five months. We get this timing basically from the books of Kings and Chronicles and Jeremiah. You have to look at them in light of each other and you, you get an idea that it was five months thereabout. <coughs> but it would very much add up. Very much add up. <coughs> okay. So, the locusts in Joel have to do in their own time with the coming invasion of Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. Foreshadowing what is going to happen with the first woe, the fifth trumpet. What happened is what is going to happen. Now, I am not suggesting that there are not aspects or ramifications of this that have implications for the Christian church. There are. But it is primarily for unbelieving Israel and the Jews. Next week, we will look more closely at those aspects of the book of Joel that have ramifications and applications for the church, pouring out my spirit on all flesh. So, what is Joel chapter 1? It is an appeal to become serious, to sober up because of what is coming. There is going to be a demonic invasion. Generally, but specifically for Israel and the Jews. You just look at Israel this week. It's, ridic it's a ridiculous situation. It's ridiculous. You have an unworkable system of democracy called proportional representation, where you have a prime minister, Arosha Memshala, who's really American, the guy's parents are from San Francisco. He lived in San Francisco, New Jersey, New York, and Montreal. He's as American as he is Israeli. Okay? Not that Netanyahu wasn't, or Golda Meir was the same. Okay, Bennett, he had 5% of the seats in the Knesset and 6% of the popular vote. <laughs> is that a government? There's no mandate from the people. The religious are going crazy. Everyone is afraid now because they've made a coalition with anti-Zionist Arabs, the former government. So instead of being politically blackmailed by the religious parties, they're going to be politically blackmailed by the left-wing Muslim parties. How absurd can you get? Muslims are 20% of Israel's population, not counting the West Bank. But the only ones who can outbreed the Muslims are Orthodox Jews. The Orthodox, especially the ultra-Orthodox Jews, outbreed Muslims. They have a baby every year in case one of them is the Messiah. They get married young and they procreate and procreate and procreate. They try to have a baby every year in case one is the Messiah. That's what... The so these people have their own agenda that's not democratic. It's built on their view of Judaism that's not scriptural. There's a situation where secular Israelis see them as charlatans, hypocrites, and even parasites. 
Yet they're the only ones who can outbreed the Muslims. <laughs> what a mess! Israel is a mess. It is a social mess. It is an economic mess. It is a religious mess. It is a political mess. If God didn't have his hand on it, it would implode. The only thing that holds Israel together is everybody else hates them. They're forced to stick together because everybody else hates them. What a mess! A hopeless mess. It's heading for a disaster. They will make a covenant with death with the Antichrist, that's for sure. Instead of looking to the true Messiah, they'll turn to a false one. Now, all these things you see now happening are very much lining up with scriptural prophecy concerning Israel. One of the most important books in understanding the future of Israel and the Jews is Joel. But for Christians, it is impossible to understand the book of Revelation unless Christians understand Joel. It's easy to see what it means for Israel. It's not so easy to see what it means for the Christian church. But it does. Joel 1 corresponds directly to the book of Revelation. It is the first woe. The first woe. It is something that happened in the days of Judah. And it's something that's going to happen again. Such it is. We've been going on for a while. We'll leave it there for now and resume with the book of Joel next week. This should take one to two more Bible studies. We will continue next week. But tonight we looked at Joel as foreshadowing the first woe. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. God bless.